thanks a lot for the, for the invitation uh, to participate in this conference. Um, good questions focus the mind, and uh, I'm delighted to be joining Dirk and Richard in this debate on this um, very important policy, policy question. Um, I should say before I begin that the, the views that are expressed in, these, in, in this slide deck, um, <clears throat> they're, they're not necessarily the views of the ECB or its governing council. It's based on joint work that I have been doing with uh, Stefan Farr, a uh, colleague at, at, at the ECB. Um, <clears throat> so this is the plan for my presentation. In some ways, there is an element of deja vu for me in being confronted with this question, since it's a question that monetary policy, the monetary policy community grappled with 15 years ago. Um, and that was the first five years that I spent at the ECB was in the monetary policy area. Um, and I was, in preparing this presentation, um, one of the, the sources that I looked back at was a, a Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago conference proceedings um, where they looked at exactly this question, uh, but from a, a monetary policy perspective. So that's going to be, that's going to be the starting point. Uh, of my presentation, but so as not to be solely putting old wine into new bottles, um, I'm going to also examine some of these issues uh, <clears throat> from the, the, the perspective of, of macroprudential policy, which is, of course is the focus of the conference today, including questions around the objective, the importance of the link to credit, assessing real economic value of asset prices, and the effectiveness of, of the available instruments. So starting with the lessons that have been learned from the, from the monetary policy debate. Stephen Cicchetti put out a C, CPR working paper in 2000, which listed five arguments um, that produced a coherent case for monetary policy to target asset prices. And they ran as follows. First, asset price bubbles exist. Second, booms and busts distort resource allocation. They affect the monetary policy objective and they threaten market liquidity and financial stability. Third, central banks are responsible for averting liquidity crisis and for, and for safeguarding financial stability. Fourth, asset price bubbles can be identified sufficiently early and central banks have the instruments available that can burst bubbles. The conclusion uh, of that paper was that monetary policy should go above and beyond mere inflation targeting and that it should aim at addressing even bursting asset price bubbles. But while coherent, um, that view was not uncontroversial. Um, indeed, there was a significant body of literature which opposed that view, countering some of Cicchetti's arguments. Blinder and Rice, for instance, argued that asset price bubbles cannot be identified sufficiently well in advance, and because of this, monetary policy uh, makers, if they are trying to target um, asset price developments, they, they run the risk of committing either type 1 or type 2 errors. That is, missing bubbles and not reacting are seeing bubbles that are not there with costly consequences. <clears throat> now, based on, Kiyotaki and, based on a Kiyotaki and Moore type model, Iaki Vielo, I have it's terrible difficulty in pronouncing that name, showed that allowing the monetary authority to respond to asset prices yields negligible gains in terms of output and inflation stabilization, questioning the effectiveness of the monetary policy instrument itself in containing house price inflation. Lars Fenson has also done some work on this, showing more recently that very large changes in interest rates would be required uh, <clears throat> to rein in asset price booms with potentially very costly consequences for, for, for the economy at large. <clears throat> and of course, Alan Greenspan made a very famous speech in Jackson Hole in 2002, which led to the conclusion that it was better for central banks to mop up after the crisis than to try to react to it before, be <clears throat> before <clears throat> before the crisis happened. So this, this became the conventional wisdom, which was known as the Jackson Hole Consensus, which said that monetary policy should only take asset prices into account to the extent that they affect inflation. And that was very much the central bank, banking orthodoxy, the, the orthodoxy that I grew up with in, the, in, the, in the, the financial stability area of the ECB until the financial crisis hit, with many, including um, Bill White at the BIS, afterwards saying leaning should replace cleaning. Uh, i.e. we should try to be more crisis preventers than crisis managers. Now, I don't intend to get into that debate here, but I think an important development has been the recognition that leaning is needed, maybe not by monetary policy, but by macroprudential policy, and I think probably this is why this macroprudential policy field has developed in the way that it has post-crisis. Now, so what can we, we learn 
from that monetary policy debate and what questions should macroprudential policymakers be asking, them, asking themselves? Well, I think a good starting point is the five sets of the, the five arguments of Cicchetti. First of all, I think there is no debate about whether house price bubbles exist or not. We've seen plenty of evidence of that over the last couple of days. Second, we know that booms and busts in housing markets distort resource allocation and that they threaten financial stability. Um, Dirk mentioned 11 out of 10 uh, crises have been due to two problems in the housing market. Third, since the global financial crisis, the macroprudential policy mandate has been recognized, especially in Europe, with the responsible authority often being the central bank. Fourth, although it is recognized and accepted that they are hard to spot, risk aversion on identifying price, asset price bubbles, which was something, for example, that we spent a lot of time worrying about when we were working on the financial stability review in the past. Can we really publish a view and say that there may be a bubble in, in an asset market. We're less risk averse about that now than we were pre-crisis. Um, and we invest considerable resources in identifying bubbles now compared to what we did in the past. Finally, um, new macroprudential policy instruments have been created for moderating the financial cycle and enhancing financial sector resilience to shocks. But the question is whether all of this provides sufficient grounds for macroprudential policy to actually counter or even try to target house price developments. Another way of thinking about this question is asking whether we have a macroprudential policy analogue to Milton Friedman's famous inflation is always and every, everywhere a monetary phenomenon. In the same way that this thinking justified monetary policy focusing on price stability, can we, can we say or can we really say, for instance, that systemic risk is always and everywhere a house price inflation phenomenon? I would contend that we cannot, uh, because the, the link between house prices and systemic risk is much looser than the link between mo money and inflation. House prices are driven by a range of factors, <coughs> supply factors, demand factors, structural factors. We've, had, we've heard plenty of explanation over the last 24 hours on that, some of them fundamental and some of them not. House prices can increase because supply declines or because demand increases, and in the latter case, credit will usually, will usually rise. What macroprudential authorities worry about is the risk that house prices, house prices rise for reasons that are not fundamental. House price rise because of expectations that house prices will, inc will rise in the future. That's when we start to get worried. When people are buying houses and, and investing in, in, in residential property purely with the expectation that they're going to, that, that they're going to get a positive return out of that. As it's under these conditions that house price bubbles form, and this can have nasty consequences if it fuels credit, especially if banks start extending mortgages with the expectation when banks themselves start believing that house prices are going to continue rising, <clears throat> then we really have a cause for concern um, that a bubble is beginning to form. But house prices, of course, can also rise for sound fundamental reasons, say a lasting shift in demographics, which can also fuel credit. I think we had some explanation of that yesterday on, on, on migration patterns, for instance. And of course, the challenge is to distinguish between the two cases, um, the fundamental and the non-fundamental. And I'm going to get back to this um, in a moment. But in my view, um, <coughs> Dirk mentioned Minsky. I also like Kindleberger. Uh, Kindleberger uh, <coughs> wrote a very nice book in, in 1978 called Manias, Panics and Crashes. And he spends a lot of time explaining how bubbles require credit to breed. Um, so in, the, in this passage that I've, that I've taken from his book, which I'm not going to read out now, but the, the, I've underlined in, the, in, just that short, in, the, in just that short sentence, or, or a couple of sentences, credit is mentioned three times. Uh, and of course that was at the bottom of the Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, and the argument is often used to explain why the bursting of the dot-com bubble was not very costly, but the, but, the, but the bursting of the housing market bubble in the US was. Uh, credit played little role in the first, uh, but was center stage in the second. So this has been very well documented in a cross-country analysis carried out by a paper that I think all of us, all of us are quoting in, 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 this, in this conference by Jorda, Schulerich, and, and Taylor on a data set over 150 years. They distinguish between four different types of asset price bubbles, equity bubbles, and house price bubbles both with and without credit. Now some of the, the key messages of that work can be summarized with these two charts which shows 
that the average contraction in, in, in <clears throat> that shows the average contraction in GDP after a crisis erupts. Now, as can be seen, not all bubbles are the same, with some having enormous um, costs, while others having hardly any impact on GDP. Equity, bubbles, equity bubble bursts tend to be less costly than housing bubble bursts, and in both cases, as you can see, the costs are much larger when the bubble is fueled by credit. <clears throat> and of the four, <clears throat> the most costly crises are the ones where house price bubbles coincide with, with high credit growth. Now, that, that would tend to suggest that it's not ha ha house price exuberance per se that macroprudential policy makers should worry about, but the coupling of how high house price growth and credit growth. Borio and Lowe um, showed that in their pioneering work on, on early warning indicators, and we've been doing a lot of work at the ECB on that over the last couple of years as well. But what, what are the economics behind this? Well, Kiyotaki and Moore uh, showed in, <clears throat> in 1997 that when a productive asset can be used as collateral for borrowing, that can introduce a financial accelerator effect which amplifies booms and busts. In the boom, how, higher house prices uh, <clears throat> improve access to credit and so because the, the value of collateral increases and so households can consume more. In my view, uh, <clears throat> and I was very taken with the, with, with the issue that came up yesterday, I didn't see the presentation, but some colleagues were talking about the correlation between happiness and, and, and the value of, of houses uh, and the positive correlation that existed between the two. I mean, <clears throat> I think Kiyotaki and Moore uh, is helpful in explaining this. In my view, it's, it's, it's a wealth illusion. Um, there's a large part of the population that believes that they are more wealthy, and because, they're, because they believe they're more wealthy, they consume more because the value of the houses uh, <clears throat> are higher. But of course, when the, when, when the bubble eventually, eventually bursts, um, <clears throat> Kiyotaki and Moore show, then you will have a, much, a greater amplification of the downturn um, because house prices are, are declining. So the wealth illusion evaporates and you have, um, you have these very costly booms and it, it, it costly busts. And it, it, it probably also explains why, because household ownership is wider than equity ownership, why um, you have a bigger impact from the house price declines and the equity price declines. So, the job for the macro prudential policymaker, if we're really going to think about uh, house, price, house prices and house price bubbles and trying to detect them and, and trying to contrive uh, macro prudential policy responses, is trying to separate the fundamental from the non fundamental. So, I have all the list of factors there. I won't go through all of it in detail, but the, the main point is that. If you don't have a good model for house prices, you, you cannot predict the house prices perfectly, you run the risk of type 1 and type 2 errors. So false warnings of bubbles, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> which could be due to, for, for instance, supply side effects, um, but you, you, have a, you have a policy response which may not be appropriate, or otherwise you might miss a bubble. Uh, <clears throat> because, for example, as, as Dirk mentioned, I like this, this time is different. You, people become very convinced by the, this time is, is, is different explanation and there is no policy response and of course that's also, that's also a problem um, in, in, in setting house prices as, a, as, as an explicit target. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what should a macro potential policy maker do? Well of course I said credit, house prices, so there are potentially two, two operational objectives. Uh, for the macro prudential policy maker. One is house prices, one is credit. Uh, <clears throat> the pros and cons of, of, of targeting each um, are on the one hand, house prices are observable, um, but on the other, it depend on, house prices depend on, on, on debt levels, risk expectations, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> targeting housing credit, is, it's observable. Uh, it has a direct link to, to uh, systemic risk and financial stability. And it directly counters the risks that we should be worried about, the exposures that, that, that the financial system itself has. Um, I think it really boils down to, um, Dirk mentioned some work that I have been doing with, with, with Stefan Farr um, on, the, on the whole Tinbergen approach to how to assign um, policy instruments to objectives. Now here, this is really just a, a, a thought experiment where I asked the question, <clears throat> I started thinking about the question of this conference, uh, targeting house prices. Well, is macro potential policy the best policy set of tools to, to aim at that objective? You can have other policy tools. Adam Posen from the Peterson Institute <coughs> said some years ago when he was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the, of the Bank of England that it might be better to use property taxes to influence the price of houses. So coming to this question, um, 
that, that, well, first of all, Tinbergen showed in the 1950s that for every independent policy objective, policymakers need separate policy tools. Robert Mundell went a bit further and said that for, <clears throat> for it, most policy objectives are not completely independent of one another. They have relationships with, with, with one another. So in that instance, the policymaker should try to find the tools that have the comparative advantage, the greatest potential effect on, on, on the objective. So what I've, done, what I've done here is just drawn a couple, two loci, one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. One is, at, at all points, it's, it's combinations of property taxes and macroprudential policy where you have house price stability. So that's maybe some small deviation from the equilibrium. Um, on the right-hand side, um, debt sustainability. So the ability of the household sector to honor and, 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 and repay their, their, their debt obligations. And the only... So, I, I hope there's no controversy about, about the, the sign of the slopes of those two lines. Then the question is, of those two uh, <coughs> sets of policies, which one is the most effective in dealing with, with, with the level of house prices? So I just made an assumption here that property taxes are more effective in influencing the level of house prices. Um, and macroprudential policy has a greater impact on uh, debt sustainability of, of households. That's all. That's the only assumption that I've made here in drawing the, these relative lines. But when you put the two of them together, um, and suppose the policymaker is confronted with the situation that's depicted on point A, uh, where debt is sustainable, but house prices are too high relative to equilibria, what should be the policy response there? Now, suppose the conclusion is to tighten macroprudential policy uh, <clears throat> to bring down house prices. Well, that leads to a movement from point A to point B where house price stability is reached, but house prices are now lower. And, of course, because you have tightened macroprudential policy, there have been some real, econ real economic consequences as well as that. Is coming from that, real economic activity is slowing down because credit is less available. So you have a contraction um, of economic activity which has an influence on debt sustainability. So now you've got a situation where, because macroprudential policy was tightened, you have managed to bring your housing market bubble in, uh, under control, but you've now created a situation where um, the, um, the, the, the sustainability of debt of households is now, is now threatened. And you've actually created a, a financial stability problem by tightening, macro, by, by, ta by tightening macroprudential policy. So the point here is that the response <coughs> that the optimal policy response possibly was not um, a tightening of macroprudential policy, but an increase in property taxes. That might have been the best response in this case. Now, of course, as I said, it's, it, it's entirely dependent on the assumption and whether you accept uh, that property taxes are more influential on the level of house prices than, than, than macroprudential policy is. Now, but why would macroprudential policy be less effective than property taxes in, in impacting house prices? Well, I think it's instructive to think about the, the transmission mechanisms of macroprudential policy measures. Uh, I've taken this from a, a report of a working group that I, that I participated in some years ago of the Committee on the Global Financial System, which looked at transmission channels of, of different macroprudential policy instruments. So the, <clears throat> this is the transmission mechanism of, um, of, of, of capital-based instruments. Um, and so the idea here is that you, you, you increase capital requirements in some way or another, that creates a capital shortfall, uh, where banks have a choice in the way in which they can close that capital shortfall. They can address it, for example, by increasing lending spreads, reducing dividends, or undertaking even uh, new equity issues. Uh, <clears throat> or um, they, can also, they, they can also deleverage. Um, and then, we, we, some people were discussing terms of, of price and quantity-based measures yesterday. If the Modigliani-Miller doesn't hold, then there is also a price effect. Uh, <clears throat> but with the new world order that we are moving into of bail-in, um, <clears throat> the likelihood that there would be a price impact from these capital-based measures is becoming more and more, becoming less and less likely. So capital-based measures are unlikely to have an, a, a big impact on, on, on house prices. <clears throat> on borrower-based measures, the transmission is a bit different. Um, it runs more directly to, to the impact on the credit cycle. Um, it runs through credit demand. Uh, <clears throat> but the empirical evidence um, which I quote in this slide, um, that has been done in a number of jurisdictions, and I think in particular some of the work that has been done at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, has shown that borrower-based instruments um, 
while they may have some impact on house prices, the impact is relatively, is relatively minor. So you cannot expect that macroprudential policy instruments are going to have a big impact on, on house prices themselves. But what, what, what they do have an impact on, of course, is on credit. And credit is what um, we should be worried about um, from a macroprudential policy perspective, especially if um, it becomes excessive. So, I see I've got one minute left, so hopefully it's enough time to go through my concluding remarks. And, and that's basically four points. Um, I don't think that it's clear that stabilizing housing, house prices is a macroprudential policy uh, objective. Um, in fact, creditless um, house price booms are possible, and they're not as costly as I showed from, from, from the, the paper of Jordan at all uh, as, as house price booms that are fueled by credit. But even if stable house prices were a macroprudential policy objective, the challenges in assessing fundamental values are great. Uh, and that runs, of course, the risk of type 1 and type 2 errors for, for policy making. Even if we didn't have those type 1 and type 2 errors, if, if house prices were perfectly predictable, it's not clear that the macroprudential policy toolkit itself contains the most effective instruments for moderating house price uh, booms and busts. Um, the, the straw man that I set up on, on property taxes suggest that there might be other policy instruments that will be more effective in containing house prices than the macroprudential policy instrument toolkit that we have. That said, although macroprudential policy may have limited effects on, on house prices in the long run, it can still focus on, on countering systemic risks that are countered by, by house price booms by ensuring that credit growth and leverage um, do not become excessive. And I think that is, uh, for me, um, the most important um, that macroprudential policy should aim at uh, containing credit growth. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Lots of 